Hi, Monroe. Hi. How are you? I'm really good. How are you? I'm okay, yeah. I'm very honoured and privileged to be talking to you. Oh, thank you. Well, same here because I've just spent the last two days watching oh, <laughs> every single episode and I, you're my favourite character. It's very nice to hear. I think um, you are an ally for unheard voices and thank you. I feel what you're doing is so important and brave and brilliant. So thanks. Let's chat. Let's <laughs> chat. <laughs> I think we were going to start by talking about um, these sort of big emotive nouns and I suppose I wanted to ask you how you had coped with feelings of shame in your life if you had had any. Yeah, I think shame is something, it's an, it's an emotion that can really dictate everything in your life. I used to experience so much shame from my sexuality. And if it wasn't my sexuality, then it was my gender. And if it wasn't my gender, it was my race. Mm. Being a marginalized person in the UK, it's sort of something that you can identify with and having your identity be used against you, you can feel ashamed of yourself. And it's just, so, it's such a liberating thing to realize that what makes you different is actually what makes you special mm -hmm. it, it's what it's your it's your superpower it's ultimately a useless emotion mm -hmm. nothing good comes from shame you can use it like to drive yourself out of it and then be constructive but ultimately feeling shame is like feeling guilt yeah it's better to just use it as um ammunition i yeah. think and use it to drive yourself forward but you need to let you need to let that shame go <laughs> I wondered if you might talk to us about um, a time in your life when you were really deeply shocked, the most shocking moment of your life. I think the most shocking moment of my life was definitely the first media storm slash scandal mm -hmm. that I experienced in 2017. And watching episode one, you guys got it pretty bang on okay. with, with almost feeling like the world is collapsing around you and being on a high and I was on such a high I just got a really big contract with a beauty brand and then that happened and I was like I, it almost just felt like the world was on fire around me. It was so heartbreaking for me personally to spend so much time speaking about racism and calling racism out and wanting to be part of the change and then suddenly being framed as the racist. Suddenly people hate you and they don't know you. They've never talked to you. They've never seen your vulnerable side. They've never seen or experienced your softness or see you with your family. They don't see any of the stuff that makes you human. They just see one thing and they build a whole identity around that one thing of who they think that you must be. No one can prepare you for being on every single newspaper in the country and then all of the internet stuff that comes with it as well and being exposed to so much violence and how easy it is to abuse somebody over the internet. People threatening to rape me and kill me and put me in a box and post it to my parents and thinking that that is better than what I said. I, I would never understand it. Oh God, it's all coming back. 
it's difficult to be seen as your least favorable moment by a lot of people. And that really stuck with me for a long time. And it's only really now that I think people have actually started to understand what I was speaking yes. about three years ago. And, you know, a lot of the people that really bashed me three years ago and made my life hell have actually turned around and said, you know what, I was wrong. So the first experience of denial in your body was realizing you were trans or? I think it was realizing or thinking that I was gay. Okay. I think that was the first time because I felt so ashamed of it because I just thought, you know, my, my parents are never gonna understand. I didn't see any evidence that you could be gay and be happy. So, I mean, I identify as queer now because I don't really see my sexuality in a rigid form. No. I mean, before I transitioned, I identified as gay and then I transitioned and then technically that would make me straight, but I've never felt straight in my life. And then I started to date women and then I dated trans people um, and non-binary people and ultimately it doesn't mean anything. No. If I find someone attractive, then I find them attractive. Um, Humans. Yes. Uh, so then I think the real deep, deep, deep denial that I've carried through my life was that I was trans mm. because I was conscious of the fact that I was queer, mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't I was so in denial of my transness that I didn't even realize it. It was so deep that I didn't even want to admit it to myself mm. until I was 19 and then I met my first trans friend in Brighton mm. and she saw it before I was even ready to admit it to myself. And she was like, you're, you're a sister. And then everything just slotted into place. And I was like, this, this, is, this has been it. This is, this is what I have been feeling this whole time and I wasn't aware because I'd never been exposed to another person like myself. Mm. It's like when I realized that I was black when I was a kid and I was like, why don't I look like anybody else? And my parents hadn't had the conversation with me yet because they didn't want me to feel like I was mm. left out. Back then they just didn't want to make it a thing. I just thought, why, why do I have one black parent or one white parent? Like, and I look like neither of them. Mm. And I was the only black kid in my school so that was really, really difficult. And it, it was a similar kind of feeling as like just your mind opening yeah. and thinking, oh, well, this all makes sense now. But I mean, what you're doing for kids all over, you are that girl in Brighton for thousands and thousands of people. Thank you. Let's start with what are you most afraid of? I definitely feel like I've conquered my biggest fear. Mm -hmm. I think my biggest fear was being buried as the gender that I didn't identify as. Because I had a period of time where me and my parents weren't seeing eye to eye and they weren't happy about my transition. They're the most supportive parents now. You know, they're, they're so proud of me and that's just a moment that I never thought I would ever have. Uh, so yeah, we definitely had a point in time when I thought they're, they're gonna bury me as the gender that I don't identify with and I'm fuming. And I wasn't just angry, I was scared. I was petrified mm. of A, having a funeral that my friends weren't going to be at, that I was going to die young. The average life expectancy for a black trans woman is 35. Yeah. I mean, that statistic is... It's really appalling. harrowing. It's really harrowing that young black trans women have to see that. And on top of that, not have the representation to tell them otherwise. Yeah. I think when I was a kid, I was constantly scared. Mm -hmm. I was just constantly scared of everything because I was scared of being found out. Mm. Um, I grew up in a time which um, Section 28 um, was still uh, there in schools. And if anyone doesn't know what Section 28 is, it was a piece of legislation that was passed in the late 70s, um, which meant that schools couldn't promote homosexuality, which meant that they couldn't speak about homosexuality at all, which meant that if a kid was being bullied in school, nothing could really be done about it because they couldn't 
condemn the bullies for being homophobic. It was just very much like, break it up, break it up, boys will be boys, that kind of thing. And um, the result was me not really being able to walk even without, without feeling like I had to put one foot in front of the other. I hated school so much, <laughs> hated it so much. So if, you, if you're in school right now and you, you, you're finding it difficult to deal with it, it you know, you're, you're not the only one and it, it will get better. But, you know, no kid should ever have to feel that way. And that's why it's so important that we speak about our fears. Mm -hmm. Because once, if I was able to have sp like talked about it, then it would have reduced it. But mm -hmm. If we're just allowing the fear to build inside of us, it takes on a whole different shape. It turns into this thing that is bigger than it actually is. The, the fearfulness is worse than the thing you, yeah. you can't bear to face. Yeah. Have you come to a point with, with people where you have bargained or negotiated and it's, there's been a positive outcome and you've thought, okay, I'm, I'm actually I think so. heartened yeah. by that. If you can understand me, and if you don't understand what my communities have gone through, the payoff is that it makes you a better person. Mm. If you understand and if you take the time to listen to the stories of people who aren't like you, that widens your consciousness and it can only make you a better person. Mm. So I think that's my bargain. Yeah. What is something that, or is there anything that you feel guilty about? My guilt is based in, in inaction. Mm -hmm. If I think, oh, I could have done that, or I could have, you know, I could have pushed myself more then. And I think it's just, if you try and avoid guilt, then you actually become much more productive. Yeah, guilt is another society, another gift from society, I think, yeah. isn't it? I think it can be a really constructive energy or mm -hmm. it can be a really useless energy. I think if you just sit there and feel guilty about something, then that doesn't achieve anything and you don't learn from it. Mm. But if you actively learn from what you do and make sure that you don't do it again, mm. then I, th I think I'm much more driven by figuring out the worst case scenario <laughs> before it happens and then making sure that that doesn't happen. And there's, there's you know, it's, it's in the media, isn't it? Like, oh, a guilty treat or guilt. And it's just, mm. it's nonsense. It's mm -hmm. something that, you know, they, they sow all sorts of things into our minds mm -hmm. that we have to unpick. Mm -hmm. Whenever I've watched you in total admiration, you are so self-possessed, composed, regal, I'd say. And Thanks. the people around you are often getting angry and they can't control themselves. Mm -hmm. And you remain serene. And I just wondered if that's something that you've learned to do or? I think it's more just having gone through the ringer and recognizing finally the humanity in myself. Mm -hmm. And then when you recognize the humanity in yourself, you can see it in others. Mm -hmm. And then you start to think, nobody can talk badly to me because we're all humans. You know, and once you start thinking of other people who are superior to you, then you allow people to talk badly to you. Mm. And if somebody is going to shout at me and is going to deny my lived experiences, is going to condemn my communities and other people that share my identities as something that we're not, mm. I'm just going to let them mm -hmm. because... There's no point in me getting upset by somebody who's ignorant. Mm -hmm. Their hurt is manifesting in their harm towards other people. Mm. Thank you for the regalness though. <laughs> no, it's so regal. <laughs> I don't see myself as very regal. Oh, so um, regal. I'm glad that I seem calm because it's something that I've definitely worked at. I but because wasn't. Because you've done the work. That's yeah. another thing. I think I was, you can see that is yeah. that you just know and you've I lived the experience. I was really angry though when you I said was a growing kid. Up. Yeah, I was so angry. I just didn't have anywhere to put it. And this is why I know that these people that lash out and shout at people on television or, you know, they're unhealed people. Mm. And it's very much like, oh, I'm going to point the finger at you because it's easier than looking inside. Yeah. 
Monroe, do you accept who you are? I respect who I am. And I think that we use the word acceptance interchangeably with other things when we should really be saying other things. I agree. And I think a lot of people say, I accept you, when they really should be saying, I respect you. Definitely. Um, it sounds a lot like tolerate. Tolerate is the like, worst. Uh, Yuck. Uh, <laughs> I think I understand people. Mm -hmm. I try to understand people as much as I can. Mm. Um, and I respect people. I respect everybody as human beings, mm. unless you give me a reason to not see you in a respectful light. Like, I don't respect your actions, mm. but I respect your humanity. Mm. Is, it, is it about trying to always see the good? I think it's to see that we're all people mm. and even the worst people on earth, there's a reason why they're the worst people on earth. Mm. Maybe they had a terrible childhood. Maybe they were abused. Mm. Maybe they um, have many unhealed parts of their own identity that they're battling with. So they take it out on other people. Mm. I think, yeah, as we said earlier, once you re recognize the humanity in every single person, you become less scared of them. The, the gap between you is closed. Yeah, oh, definitely. And you, you know, if we could share, if we had a backpack each of all the stuff we've been through and we could just lay it all out here, if we could do that with everyone, yeah. it would be such a different state of affairs than just the person that you meet. Definitely. And I think, you know, it's not just about recognizing what makes us the same, it's understanding that our differences is like oh, what makes us. And celebrated. Yeah. So I understand and I respect other people mm -hmm. and I guess that's what other people mean by acceptance. Mm -hmm. So we have tackled eight big emotive yeah. words that bring up all sorts of things. So thank Been you a journey. for <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for digging deep and excavating things that I know are not always easy. You're an absolute wonder and inspiration. Thank so. you. And thank you for such an amazing show. Oh well you're welcome. I really enjoyed it. I'm so glad. <laughs>